Good morning, everyone. I'm grateful to be here on this awesome Saturday, November 12th, to talk more about the book. <laughs> to talk more about this book, An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. And the author is Neil Gabler. And I'm so grateful uh, yesterday, or last week, not yesterday, to have started a discussion of this book, uh, chapter by chapter. Um, just looking at um, some key parts. We ended last week on uh, the first chapter, and now we're going to continue looking at the uh, second chapter and the third chapter. And I'm grateful. Good morning. Glad to see uh, Jerry. Make sure I don't drop the phone. Great. I had dropped it a little bit there. Thank you. All right. Yes. With Jared. Good morning, Jared. How are you? Make, give him his time to come in and making sure I'm set up here. It's a beautiful sunny day. The um the sun sets sooner in this Scorpio season, um, heading into fall, and then it rises earlier. Here we go. Okay. So I'm very excited to talk about the next part of this interesting book, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. Okay, I hit accept. And let's see, let me try it again. I'm touching accept. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Oh, you Peace. Good morning. I can hear you clearly. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I can. I Great. can. Great. All right, good, good, good. Peace to you and, and your audience. Looking forward to this. Yes, me too. So glad to see everybody. And we're just going to tackle the main points. Um, I was thinking so much as I was reading, Jared, about the present situation um, that we're in in terms of the industry and how... Um, it just reminds me, reading this book, the importance of supporting independent artists, independent filmmakers particularly, because their message matters. I'm thinking of Dee Reese. I'm thinking of Michael Dennis, um, their work with independent film. And I'm thinking of their energy as I read about Zucor and I read about Lemley, and I read in the fourth chapter about the Warners, you know, the entrepreneurial energy, there is no obstacle. And I think that's the common theme of a successful artist. Um, the money will be found, you know, um, even though I didn't originate it in the case of a lot of these uh, film moguls, I will still promote it despite whatever you know so i just want to say the the never giving up the energy of never giving up is is what speaks to me in this segment any general thoughts so that's interesting uh, uh well i certainly would support that general idea of not giving up uh my reaction to this to this for today's reading is maybe a little bit different um because what what I walk away with is uh, sort of more of an understanding of obviously my bias, my own current argument about the very combative, hostile, and consolidated and politicized nature that is mass media and the culture industries and the mainstream and pop culture, et cetera, and so forth. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there for now. But the, the only the, the other big theme that I, I, I couldn't get away from
from is that uh, because of this current moment, reading this now uh, in the heat of, of all of these latest controversy, or well, the latest, not controversy, but, but uh, debate or exchange, uh, and especially after watching, for instance, Minister Farrakhan's uh, speech the other day, um, what I'm reconfirmed in is my uh, conclusion that every that sort of both sides are willfully playing a game that allows for conservative anal- conservative analysis to dominate and allows for both groups to promote the, the, to the extent possible the bourgeoisies within their group. Yes, no question. And then the, the, the very last part, if I could just say one more thing, is that this book, specifically I'm thinking of how this book does not do anything yeah. to address the impact of these Jews in Hollywood on black and other communities. So, so in other words, it, it it leaves the reader, the uninformed reader, with this with this truly misunderstanding mm-hmm. about this group of entrepreneurial Jews that came over here and withstood all the odds and built this thing uh, and created this this thing we now all know and love called Hollywood. And so what is that misunderstanding? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What is that misunderstanding uh, 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 you mentioned? So in other words, so in other words, just, just as an example, because I, I feel I've already I've already opened up talking too long. Is that that for instance, when 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 uh, and I forgot exactly where it is, um, mm-hmm. where they t- when he brings up that is Gabler brings up Birth of a Nation, okay, and D. W. Griffiths. Yes, mm-hmm. there's zero discussion of the racism. The zero discussion of, of the, the content yes. of the and and how politically mm-hmm. Woodrow Wilson was using that film yes. to promote U.S. Uh, 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 segregation and white supremacy at home and imperialism abroad. So he he just mentions it in passing and mention you know talks about the you know the, the talent and the wealth of Griffiths and then he puts it in the context of uh, this this emerging industry. Uh, but but because he doesn't address that and mm-hmm. never does, okay. again we're left with this this incomplete narrative that that I think informs or misinforms the con the, the conversation happening right now between black communities and Jews. Mm. That's a point well taken. Um, I I agree with you that he does not discuss the content of Birth of a Nation in the way that it should. It's kind of scares people. I think the energy of Birth of a Nation, I feel, all throughout D.C. as a D.C. resident, right? Um, <laughs> especially among D.C. elected officials, they behave um, with other melanated Blacks as if they were in Birth of a Nation. That's mm-hmm. the, definitely the energy I get. Um, and so you're right. Um, um, Gabler, the author of this book, does not even mention that. And the reason for that, in my mind, is because of what you said last week that this is definitely a liberal history. Um, but I still believe like Florida Evans told Michael Evans on Good Times, you know, as bad as public school is, you would know it was bad if you didn't go to the real books outside of the public school education. So similar to these histories that we get, you know, um, from a liberalist perspective and that are definitely written for other liberals, you see the problems in it, but you still read it. Um, to understand, like you said, what's missing and what's missing, you know, definitely, because I think it was in the second chapter, was the content. What is Birth of a Nation about, you know? Um, And how was it in line with, as you said, Wilson's policy of domestic segregation um, and and imperial um, dominance? You know, how do we continue that? How do we continue those narratives? So I think that... That is why the whole point of this uh, weekly book talk is to fill in those gaps that, that these liberal histories get and to encourage us as readers to continue doing that in other liberal histories and other histories that we get that we see um, deliberately excludes um, the work. You know, this is all happening in my mind. This time period is the time period of Marcus Garvey's influence through his newspaper. And so 
it is so necessary. Horace Campbell was the first one to really write it from my memory, um, to really underscore the importance of Garvey's message in the late 19-teens, 1918, 1919, to combat what you said Wilson was trying to do through uh, the, 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 the genre of film by promoting films like Birth of a Nation. Um, we but even, that, even the specifics of the Birth of a Nation film in that time in 1915, even just before Garvey, when you have Booker T. Washington and yes. uh, was it T. Thomas Fortune and others? I forgot exactly who was involved, but they were aggressively trying to prevent the distribution of Birth of a Nation. And they were even talking about developing their own film, Birth of a Race, which I think came out after Washington's death or something like that. I don't remember that. History okay. too well. Birth of a Race. Yeah, they were, but they had, because the, the point was, and this is sort of what, what Gabler, and my point is, is what Gabler is missing, and what, what I think becomes a theme throughout uh, 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 the history of Jews as told by Jews, and then the history of Jews as picked up and adopted and regurgitated in some, I think, conservative black circles, which is that if you, if you leave out uh, uh, some of this context, so, so in other words, the, 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 the context that Gabler does include is often left out of uh, conservative black recitations of, of the history of Jews. And the, the history of black people is left out of the history written about Jews by Jews. So, so, when, the, so, and so when the two groups end up meeting, it's only in hostile conflict or at the point where somebody like Kanye or Kyrie says something. Uh, or or the or the ADL in green black comes out and says something uh, 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 condemning uh, black people and anti-Semitism. So so my point is is that that when if, if Gabler had stopped for a second and said let me just put in a let me just focus for just a couple of pages and say uh, while while I forgot which one I think was it was it Louis B Mayer I forgot which one he was talking about but but because the Birth of a Nation really only comes up in this book to tell the story of how uh, Mayer wrestles uh, Lem, control please. over the distribution of film from Thomas Edison. Yes. So, they, so which is fascinating. Uh -huh. but if you Electricity. Know, it, right, but Edison, right, but it had also had, it had imposed himself at, on the technology of film. So, so that's what Gabler was talking about in that section, that, 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 that this, is, this becomes a, a struggle. Uh, so nobody... In Gabler's view, nobody is intently focused on the, the politics of the content other than the filmmaker Griffiths. So Griffiths, the overt racist and rich white man that wants to make his argument, he's doing his thing. He's like, I'm making my propaganda. But at the, at the other level or another plane or parallel lane, you have Edison, the Gentile, struggling with Mayer, the Jew, over who's going to control the technology that allows for the mass production and distribution of these films. So, so Mayer, in wrestling uh, 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 the rights over Birth of a Nation away from Edison, if I'm remembering, if I got this, some of these details, I might need to be checked on, but, the, but this, is, this is what Gabler is basically his focus. In, in, in doing that, that gave Mayer and this and yet another Jew this another foothold in 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 what would become, as he talks about in subsequent chapters, the the, the movement west and the, the the evolution of Hollywood itself. But what I'm just simply trying to say is that by ignoring the black part and ignoring that in that moment. You had black people on the ground saying, hold up, I don't give a damn who's owning and controlling the technology and the distribution. The content that's being distributed is destroying us. It's needing to destroy us. And, and that sets in motion this conflict that is happening right now today that is not being discussed by anybody appropriately. Uh, which is, again, why I appreciate you hosting this conversation, because I, we may be the only two people in the world right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. It but, like, very few people are having, I think, a real conversation about these histories at this point. Yeah. Yes, because we need this discussion. Like, what is the content? What is the message of the content? And I appreciate that. I wanted to just uh, rattle off a few points in the second chapter um, and get your thoughts on it if you have any. He, be, he talks about two moguls, Carl Lemley, Carl Lemley, and he talks about Fox. Um, what you mentioned 
um, I'm just looking at page 58 in my print copy, mm -hmm. um, that part where it was from Lemley that Edison um, wrestled um, with control, a license from the patents company, um, that it seemed Edison was in control of. Lemley would get his films from Europe, which lay outside Edison's legal jurisdiction, uh, um, Gabler writes, and from those producers willing to have willing to braid the patents company, having thrown down the gauntlet, um, Lemley and Cochrane promptly launched a campaign in the trade papers encouraging others to do the same. The trust that, like you said, um, Jared, Edison was part of were primarily older white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who had entered the film industry in its infancy by inventing, bankrolling, or tinkering with movie hardware. Um, and eventually, Lemley um, and Zucor, you know, would, like you said, take over this industry, take over this industry. Um, skipping to page 63, just um, touching on the main ideas of this chapter before we leave it. In May 1910, Lemley and a number of his fellow independents had formed an alliance, the Motion Picture Distributing and Sales Company. And when we, when we talk about what makes a film sell? It's distribution. And we see in 1910 that this industrial control begins of a film's distribution. Um, this alliance, the Motion Picture Distributing and Sales Company, consolidated their efforts by buying films made by independent producers, you know, he's calling them independent now, and selling them to independent exchanges. Those in turn rented the films to exhibitors. Um, so that's a group. Um, and then um, when the dust settled in 1915, uh, Gabriel writes, Lemley was firmly in control of Universal. And just as I was reading this part, I remember looking on my TV and seeing um, Universal buys the rights to Snoop Dogg's story, Snoop Dogg's biopic. And I was like, wow, you know, synchronicity is real, you know. You read about something in a book and then you see it on your phone or on a TV, you know. So, but, but so again, and this is the part that I keep thinking gets left out, or many of the parts that keeps getting left out. Mm -hmm. Just as then as is now, the, 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 the face, the known leadership, the overt leadership are Jews. But that's not necessarily the case in terms of the overall even broader structure. Right. So, you know, Universal today is, for instance, the largest music company and one of the largest, biggest, com biggest media companies in the world. But it is itself a, 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 a subsidiary of larger conglomerates, whether it's Vivendi or, or BlackRock, which itself headed by Larry Fink, uh, a, a Jew. But still, the point being that, that there are other forces involved in, in, in the ownership and management of it. And then there's the, the political forces in terms of the, the goal of uh, the, the, uh, um, the broader power structure. So remember, the, the, what, 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 at least what Gabler is arguing drove these particular Jews to outstruggle the, the remaining wasps in that in that uh, uh, okay. early 20th century you know, struggle for, for you know, control. What, what he says encouraged them was that, A, uh, wasps had other avenues in the economy and in the state for power. You know, he's talking about, Gabler's talking about how Jews at this time were still not in, in government. Jews were still not, you know, Jews are not in the CIA. They're not in the FBI. They're not in, they're not in government. Hoover wouldn't allow what's one of these characters that he's talking about to speak at his uh, inauguration because he was still, because Jews were still not allowed to be an overt part of the WASP dominated superstructure or power structure. So uh, 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 these Jews having this lane to go in uh, um, were emboldened and encouraged to, to, to stay in it and struggle with it. And then the second part Gabler points to is that they had this overarching desire beyond what even wasps had 
to recreate the national fantasy of what this place is because they wanted to project and create something that was for them a safety valve and an escape from Eastern Europe and the, and the, the, the horrors they suffered there. So, uh, uh, you know, somebody commented when, when I posted last week's video on, on our channel that uh, uh, they were not really believing that there were ever there was ever a time where Jews had been poor or were oppressed, um, and and I bring that up to say that this is why the context that Gabler does focus on I think is important because it reminds the 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 sort of the the backdrop that inspired Jews these particular Jews to want to create what 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 we now know of as Hollywood uh, um, because it was again they were creating an escape. And so they wanted to help the national project. Uh, and I'll find a quote here in a second that I thought really, really encapsulated but this point. But, but that's something I thought was very interesting in what Gabler was saying here right. about this, this struggle with the wasps that were remaining in, 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 uh, in, in, in power at the time. And the, the, the ability to create stories and, and how when you do create those stories, you create myths. Uh, you, have a, you have an enormous power. Uh, That's right. in, in the story that you create. Um, I'm just running so I got the, can, I'm sorry, can I just, just read this sure. one part real quick? Sure. Um, it's for me on page, well, for me, it's 152. I don't even, okay. this, is, this is one of the problems with, 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 the, with the Kindle and, and the verses. Um, but it's in, uh, maybe I can even help a little bit here. Uh, no, I can't. Anyway, let me just read the quote. Uh, what okay. Gabler says here, he's talking about Louis B. Mayer here. He says, what Mayer did in the 30s, what he was situated to do as a Jew yearning to belong, was provide reassur reassurance against the anxieties and disrupt disruptions of the time. He okay. did this by fashioning a vast, compelling national fantasy out of his dreams and out of the basic tenets of his own dogmatic faith, a belief in virtue, the bulwark of family, in the merits of loyalty, in the soundness of tradition, in America itself. Native-born, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant Americans could share this fantasy with Mayer and even call it their own, but it is unlikely that any of them could have or would have invented it. To do so, one, one would have needed the same desperate longing for security that Mayer and so many other Hollywood Jews felt. So that's what I keep, that to me, it says it perfectly. Jews, these Jews were terrified of the wasps okay. and wanted to create a safety, safe place for themselves within the wasp world. That's what they aspired to. And in so doing, and this is the part Gabler leaves out, in so doing, have forever put themselves in opposition to black people, to working people, to, to, to radical Jews, to, mm -hmm. to radicalism itself. Because this, this project that Gabler, the other part he leaves out, and, and he doesn't say specifically, is that this is a conservative, reactionary, capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist project that, that, that this uh, um, uh, uh, invention uh, uh, these Jews were participating in building, were creating, and that's that's the that's what we're part of why we have this tension going on to this day. Uh, mm -hmm. um, he's talking about this as a safety and a heroic endeavor, and he leaves out the fact that this causes, and then and now, a lot of pain for a lot of people. Definitely, right? and it, the whole point of. So to alleviate that pain, including this discussion, just I encourage our audience to understand part of what, especially what your work on Malcolm X, particularly Manning Marable's biography of Malcolm X that you pointed out is the framing and how what we see in what um, these Jews were able to do remarkably, we have to see it as a framed narrative, as, as not the history, close the book, shut off the film. Now that we know, it's always more detailed and it takes independent uh, research outside of what Wall Street or what Hollywood gives you. What I found interesting was his uh, footnote. I believe it was in the fourth chapter about when these, um, it was particularly Fox, 
uh, no, he was talking about, yeah, he was talking about Fox in this particular part on 132, page 132. When we operated on picture money, Cecil B. DeMille once said, and we know DeMille with his biblical films like the Ten Commandments. Um, DeMille said, when we operated on picture money, there was joy in the industry. When we operated on Wall Street money, there was grief in the industry. So you definitely saw the motive to, by that logic, present the happy ending. Uh, but that's still a myth and it's still framed. Um, it's still it's still wedded to the idea of, of birth of a nation, which is um, what was mentioned in, um, you know, the idea of white superiority, that there's a necessity for it in order to control the quote unquote dangerous wild black population. Um, that subtext, seeing the larger picture, seeing it, seeing it for what it is, which is, encouraging working class people to be middle class, you know, that they can be part of it, that to be part of it is enjoyable and it should be something they want to be in. Um, so pre presenting that dream, presenting that ideal um, at the expense of, you know, people of color, at the expense of them being stereotyped. So just the framing, I appreciate the framing you have. Um, any more? Gabler, Gabler does not mention black people at all in this book. I yes, word that's, it, that's why I wanted to read it. Yeah. Yeah. Because so I mean, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, yeah. I, to see, you know, who the major players were and how each of them, even though black people were not present, this is how many of the scholars we look up to today grew up. You know, on literature where we were absent, but it's mm -hmm. so instructive about how uh, how much of a myth you know the ultimate lesson is a myth and the last in the end in the latter end of the fourth chapter um gabler talks about the jazz singer and how it, it reminded me so much of tyler perry's film you know i'm mm. wondering if tyler perry you know saw it or you know but the story of the jazz singer and how that was for jews jews in america the irre uh, how irreconcilable faith is with industry, you know, and in, 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 in that paradigm, they're irreconcilable. Um, however, when I think about what Garvey did, it's not irreconcilable. You can produce about your culture in a healthy way and make money at the same time. They're, they don't have to be irreconcilable. Well, oh, I don't know if uh, I agree with that. I don't know okay. if I agree with that part. Okay, break break down what you don't agree with. Uh, I don't. As we that. leave the second chapter. Yeah, I just I just say well well, well I'll say it this way. I think that because because Gabler ignores race and class. That's because he doesn't really focus. He doesn't explicitly make plain that what he's talking about is a, is a very class and race. Uh, based narrative, uh, uh, he leaves out some very important points that 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 where well, I think he could make them more plain or more directly, which is which is that because he does actually say this without saying it in a way I would think would be more helpful that that uh, um, if you if if even the Jews who own and manage Hollywood do not produce a content that satisfies even to the point the quote you just read from from Cecil B DeMille about Wall Street if you're not satisfying that Wall Street desire or interest there will be no money there will be no money initially in investment there will be no money post post pr uh, production in in um uh, placement in theaters and distribution and then ultimately there will be no there will be no promotion and no audience uh, who will want to support that uh, or who will think or who will have their public opinion adjusted enough to go and support that. Then also, if you are black, targeting a black audience with a, a pro-black message, there's uh, even less chance of making money because black people don't have any. 
uh, black people don't have enough to create the kind of wealth that that filmmakers would want to make and what they would think that they would want to achieve, which is why they all end up, all artists end up, uh, all of us, not just art, end up in some form or fashion selling out uh, to because it, because there is a requirement of white support, white audience, if you want to actually make good money. So so uh, uh, politically. There even, you know, there, there would be no, there, there, you know, anyway, so that, that's it. I'll just stop there. That, that would be my answer to that. Okay. It reminds me of the premise of your book, um, The Myth of Black Buying Power. I remember, mm -hmm. and like you shared, you know, um, disagreement about certain aspects of the class aspects. Um, I always believe, you know, that black people have the innate ability to manifest wealth, to manifest millions immediately. Um, and so because I believe that, and there has been evidence of that in history, there's, because people shuffle money, and Gabler suggests that here, with, people shuffle money in and out of whatever bank account. Um, and I'm thinking also of Dick Gregory, and his um, worldview in terms of the mindset and how a wealth mentality, and he described the wealth mentality of the wealthiest and comparing them to his upbringing in East St. Louis. Um, how he as a child, you know, was as wealthy as, you know, a Zucor, you know, but they never met each other, but he, his mentality was, Oh, I can manifest millions. I always I have the innate ability to manifest millions. So I think when we have that, we're just not on the same page in terms of how you describe black people with that. Because if we were, then a lot wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't see a lot of things as limits. Um, but I do think part of the power of this text is um, their belief in themselves, their belief in themselves, similar to what I saw in the documentary um, by Cody Williams about Kanye. Um, despite, you know, he's an artist who, despite any obstacles, he knows he's going to manifest what he thinks. And that's why the story is important, the content. And when we go from stage to film, which is where the fourth chapter goes in, in, in um, talking about how the jazz singer's main starring stage actor declined because he did not want, he did not agree with how um, the story was changed. Jack. Um, but, but can I, I if I can, I, because I'm struggling to, to, to think about how to respond, because we definitely disagree on this point. But, yes, we do. But I, I just want to say that, that remember when, when Gabler's talking about the mindset of this literally just a handful of Jews mm -hmm. who did what they did with Hollywood. He's, he's also describing, and this is where I think the book has, has, has great value, he's describing, without maybe saying it in the direct way I would hope to, to see it, but, you know, he's, but he's nonetheless describing a lane in history, in material reality, that opened up at that moment that allowed for this handful, only a handful, of Jewish men to do what they did. This is not about a mindset of and, and, and an innate ability to manifest. This is about a material moment being taken advantage of by just a handful of people where, where as I had made a note separately, black people in this time, regardless of the mindset, which, which clearly existed, mm -hmm. could not have done what these Jews have done. So there was clearly a mindset of entrepreneurialism, of we are greater than. I'd already talked about the response to birth of a nation with birth of a race. There's a whole movement. I mean, we obviously, we all know there's so much of a movement happening. <clears throat> but the, the lane was only but so wide and only open for this particular set of European-descended Jews and men uh, uh, to, to take advantage of. So... Um, 
yeah, I, I, you know, what, what Dick Gregory did, he did for himself, fi uh, uh, filling out a lane created by a material moment in, 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 in the world or in history that only he could do. That no, world, so. people after him did, like Bill Cosby. He opened the lane for Bill Cosby, for Richard Pryor, for Kevin Hart. One at a time. And the collective is poorer. That's my point. Black people as a whole are poorer. Right. So, so Look about the so, economic system, definitely, right, but which is which is so more on overdrive now that those lanes have been opened. So the conscious ones who are aware have to see, OK, economically, I'm supposed to be, like George Jackson said, the wage slave. But I, um, I can't believe that. Um, there is an absence of our collective economic power. But what George Jackson also said was that Bill Cosby, in yes. part of the lane that he he drove in to get to where he got, was to play the symbolic antithesis to yes. what George and the Black Liberation Movement was doing. In other words, Bill Cosby was being rewarded by the state for his willingness to play a role. Uh, yeah, he played so, that so, role until he did not have to. But my, uh, okay, but, but but ultimately, but he, but okay, but ultimately, even if you, even his ability, as you say, to manifest himself millions of dollars in this material reality means, it, it, in a zero sum game, means he's taking away from all the rest of us, and he is not helping the rest of us redistribute the wealth we all help to create, which he ends up with an over and undue share of. Uh, so so it, it, his ability to manifest millions means I can't. And it has nothing to do with my innate or lack thereof ability to do so. It's that he's got it. I can't get it. Uh, so I, I, you know, anyway. But okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I yeah. don't. This is a topic we can debate all hour long. On, Absolutely. But I no appreciate question. it because it raises questions about individual versus society. You know, right, right. What are um, what are realities? What are constraints? You know, how are we going to move? And for me, it's the triumph of individual responsibility, individual responsibility, and 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 one's ability to. Um, uh, like like James Baldwin told Nikki Giovanni, most people live with the assumptions they've been given. So how much, so to what extent will I not live with the assumptions I've been given, even though I don't see an ability to profit from my idea for so long? Will I accept, oh, I guess there's you know, no hope for me to do anything, so let me stop. No, you know, especially when we read and know about the triumphs of people we study. Um, what Gabler talks about is Meyer, that on the, who, like you said last week, chose to make the 4th of July his birthday when he came to this country. Born on the 4th of July is, is Gabler's name of, of, of his third chapter. And some key points in this one, uh, Meyer, if Meyer's extremism was a form of assimilation, doing more and being more to win acceptance, Meyer's excesses worked synergistically on his second characteristic, his paternalism. His relationship to the studio was that of a warm Jewish patriarch, Danny Selznick said. Page 83, he was taunted by the local, and I, I would just love to get Gabler's breakdown of this sentence, he writes. He was taunted by the local anti-Semites and forced to defend himself. Um, he was shamelessly exploited by his father who sent him across um, Canada debated auctions on salvage while his mother wept, fearing for his safety. You know, he definitely, Gabler presents, you know, Meyer as this strong man of pride who fights all of these David and Goliath battles being the David um, and talking about his family, shows him as a family man. Um, and then in 1912, Meyer met Actually, no, this, this is, um, again, the idea. What fascinates me about Meyer and Gabler is the idea Gabler is creating about who Meyer is. At the bottom of 85, in Haverhill, I believe that's uh, Pennsylvania, 
Meyer had won considerable respect by discovering what Zucor was discovering in New York on a larger scale, that the movies could be financially rewarding and emotionally satisfying if one tapped the middle class audience. Um, that, yeah, that we see through, and we see that messaging still, you know, you could be the member, you know, the middle class is possible. And this is why I'm fascinated with the profound emotional impact that films like It's a Wonderful Life had on me and my dad. Um, the belief that, you know, don't give up. Um, it, it works, but then you have to be careful in how it works, the application of the knowledge. Um, am I here to make America yeah, I'm sorry. To be still a, an achievement gap? Or what can I do to allow voices that are never heard to be heard, you know? Um, this reminds me of Kwame Brown's YouTube talking about Lil Scrappy. He had a video yesterday where it was some documentary or some video he had of Scrappy talking about, Lil Scrappy talking about his mom doing the best she could. And he had like hours long conversation on asking his listeners whether did she do the best she could. But again, it was these films, films by Meyer, um, that promoted the entrance. Entrance into middle class life is easy, is possible, is understandable, is normal. Um, so, so those are some third chapter thoughts. Any from you? Oh yeah, I mean this chapter for me. This is this is sort of what I'm talking about. This chapter was was this chapter so far, and and I can't remember the rest of the book yet, but but. This chapter may be the most important one oh, okay. because th because for me this is the chapter that most clearly makes the point that I keep trying to to to, to make plain mm -hmm. that the whole point is uh, the fear starting with personal experience starting with the collective experience of Jews coming out of Europe at that time coming out of coming into the United States where again. I understand that that most people not familiar with this history will not be aware of just how poor and hated these groups of people were and still are in many cases uh, and in many ways if we if we pay close attention to what's really going on. But but we struggle with nuance in these days and times. So but so so uh, uh, all of these characters are saying, are, you know, Gabler is clearly laying out that they are terrified of sinking back, not just into poverty, but out of favor by a society of wasps that has been tra traumatizing and terrifying them for a long time. So uh, all the stuff you were just talking about, the, the, the treatment by his father running all over Canada, you know, the poverty, the, the abuse, whatever, all that stuff. He's running from that all the way as, he, as, as Gabler ends up talking about what, which, which led to why Jews took what became Hollywood out to California in the first place. Right. They were saying, people, it's hard to imagine, but California was not like it is now. There was not a lot of people there. There was not a lot of stuff there. There, were not, there was not a lot of, as Gabler talks about, uh, um, high society wasp structure had not evolved there. So Jews could go out there and safely create space uh, 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 and room for themselves politically and culturally and build this Hollywood thing up as long as, as you just pointed out, they got with Wall Street and targeted a, a, a middle class audience, which is the, 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 the standard to this day. But in so doing, you make sure that your politics, your worldview, your output culturally supports that project. And that's why we get from them a very conservative or at best what we would call liberal Democrat politics, which for black people and liberation and for poor people and working people is largely useless, if not outright hostile to. So 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 that's that's what I that's what I loved about this 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 chapter. Um, uh, as he says here, uh, uh, uh one other blandishment that must have drawn the Jews to California was that unlike the East, the social structure was primitive and permeable. There was no real aristocracy in place and few social impediments obstructing Jews. So they were given the room 
to go out there and do that. But the part I keep did, I wonder, you know, as long as they the, the success was tied to the broader political project of the state. So the WASP are saying, look, we don't want you over here anyway. We don't want you in our high society anyway. We don't want we don't want anything to do with, you know, but we will make use of what you produce. So make sure that what you produce makes us happy. And this is why, whether it's Jews doing it or whether it's, as you pointed out, Tyler Perry doing it or anyone else, their target audience is not black. It's it's a white affluent audience. And when that is your target audience, politically, from my humble point of view, it, it, it's a problem. So anyway, that's that. Those are just uh, an overview of what I thought about this uh, chapter. I just. Honestly, it was a little, some of it gets a little boring in, in just some of the minutiae, just following all the different names and families and some of the little details he gets into. But yes. but that overall message, I thought, I was like, man, this is this is it right here. This is, anyway. When you said um, it was, um, these, are, these were works, these were films, we were reading about films for a white audience. I couldn't help but think of um, the recent documentary by, Reginald Hudlin and Oprah Winfrey, Miss Oprah Winfrey called Sydney about Sydney Poitier and Greg Tate's point about um about I believe it was Greg Tate in that film who made the point that Sydney Poitier's films was largely for a white audience. Yeah. And so as such, you know, he had to make his choices and his moves according to that reality. Um and it was so one other I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, 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 there was one other part I was just reminded of in this chapter that when he's talking, that adds to the point I'm making, that when he's talking about the struggle, because he gets it, like, I can't remember all the details of all the names, but there's like this big beef between the Jews who were running Hollywood at the time and the Gentiles that were involved. Yes. And it talks about how uh, uh, Fox ends up losing in part because he sided with the Gentiles. Uh, uh, um, and and they pulled the money out. And, and the point is, all this financial, all this backstab, and all this this all this stuff going on between everybody involved. The point that that I walk away with that that Gabler lays out is that again, uh, and he even says at one point, uh, one of Mayer's fears, one of the fears that haunted the Hollywood Jews generally, was that it could all be taken away. It would all be taken away. <sighs> And he doesn't just, I at least read it, he doesn't just mean the Hollywood stuff. Okay. He means the freedom that Jews felt they found here in the United States. Yes. There is, and, and there is, and I think still to this day, and, 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 and I think it manifests in, in some very reactionary ways, unfortunately, but to this day, there is still that underlying Jews, even, even as, as white as they have aspired to be and have become, there is still this understanding that, uh, or this fear that, yeah, it, we got to keep our eyes on on it because at any moment these folks could come and take it away. So for all now, we can debate and people could disagree about the, the the reality of the structure, but but the point I'm just making that the Gabler talks about is that however powerful people think Jews are, right. Jews themselves right. fear that they could lose it all from, from a, a source of power that's greater than their own. So that's why I think we get so much hostility to black criticism of Jews, yes. to, uh, and we get so much willingness on the part of... Attacks, and while, accusations of anti-Semitism, yes. And while we get so much willingness on the part, particularly of conservative Jews, because that's, again, who Gabler's talking about here. We get, the, we get, a, we get a, a willingness on the part of conservative Jews to play a role in defending this empire, this, this settler colonial project of the United States. And that's where the antagonism comes. The radical Jews, so like all this time that Gabe was talking about, he's not talking about radical Jews trying to build socialism and communism and labor unions and, and you, know, you know, whatever else that they were involved in. He's not talking about them. Those Jews were being crushed by the mayors and the foxes and, the, and the, this class of Jews was crushing them. So... And so, so that narrative goes away, and the conservative narrative stays and stays ensconced, and it and, uh, comes back today, to your point, to say, here we go again, it was the black anti-Semites, it's them, da-da-da-da-da, don't get mad at us, da-da-da. But 
uh, uh, the radical, you know, the other history gets gets erased. That's all I'm saying. Erased. I wanted to read that part that you mentioned. It's on, in my print copy, page 117, about two to three pages um, from the end of the third chapter. Um, Gabler writes, only Fox had dared deal with Gentiles. And now, in his view, AT&T, Halsey, Stewart & Company, and other financiers had conspired to deny him the power to control talking pictures, an area in which Fox was pioneering and one in which they all had a financial stake. Um, yeah. Um, for Fox, it was a demonstration of how the Gentile establishment punished Jews for hubris. Lemley had had the good sense to be financed by Strauss, Zucor by Kuhn, Loeb, and the Warner Brothers by Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, all Jewish investment houses. Only Fox dared deal with Gentiles. And this is the Fox, you know, this is the same Fox that's in the 20th century Fox, you know, that we see. Um, Fox that produced the Amazing in Living Color series that when it first came out, Fox, yeah, Fox, wow. I'm just connecting, you know, to your point, the WASP culture and how, and see, that's for me. And for me, um, Jared, I'm glad you raised that because I think it ties into what I'm saying about there are no limits. So when you hear that, um, word or when you hear the accusation just like everything else in life you know study it for yourself you know for example if somebody says um slavery was a choice and you're not getting the context but immediately you're 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 having the emotional energy you're, you're being told what to feel about this statement the statement of slavery was a choice and you're being told to feel this is ignorant and you should be angry at this ignorance. Instead of seeing the greater context, seeing the framing, how is this comment framed? How, how did the person saying this comment frame it? I'm not saving it, but I'm just saying the framing um, is are, um, are people who are able to use the anti-Semite label, the only game in town, you know? Am I under complete control? And so Kanye's whole life is showing us that there are other opportunities economically and his whole renaming of himself. Um, but it comes back to, I want to just, I'm saying this because it, yeah, I just, I don't it's want tempting to, to, it's, it's tempting to yeah. say, oh my God, look how powerful this group of people are. And just like your parents, just like their parents, they had to fight to claw their way to the top. And this is still a process that history will work out, you know, um, and nobody is all powerful. You know, um, it reminds me of what um, Lorraine Hansberry's cousin, Gail Hansberry, the daughter of William Leo Hansberry um, here in DC, she's a DC resident, long time, told me, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. No one can make you feel you're nobody or you're economically done unless you i mean for me like it goes back to you know for me an issue the individual's belief in themselves despite everybody saying you can't do x you can't do y and i know you know you and i disagree but i i, I just wanted to point out in the book about where um fox was you know determined not to uh not to be overwhelmed you know he, because of his belief in himself you know he, he's he, he did not allow um others opinions of him and i'm saying this also thinking about relationship i watch a lot of relation i mean i know i'm a historian and scholar and of sorts but i think a lot about too um particularly april mason what she said about black men approaching her romantically and she said you know they, they lack confidence you know, and it's motivating for me because with everything I found, all the obstacles, all the attempts I've made and the failed attempts I've gone through, I'm still not going to give up on what I believe. Um, and slowly I see it manifesting. So reading this book, I can't help but talk about, because as Sharon Downer of First ba um, 
what's the name? Lenox Road Baptist Church in Brooklyn on the corner of Nastran and um, Nastran and Rogers Avenue in East Flatbush. She said, as you read the Bible, the Bible will read your life. So I can't, I'm just sharing, you know, how this is reading my life in terms of Fox's uh, 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 unwillingness to be, you know, to be intimidated by people who didn't believe in what he was trying to do. Let me see. So, this. but, but, but if I can just, so this is, so just to, to highlight the, 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 the departure point for the two of us, when you bring up uh, Lorraine Hansberry, yeah. uh, you interpret her and, and, and cherry pick one, one point for your argument. I'm going to do the same for mine. Cause in another instance, she is, she said something, one of my favorite quotes of all time, when she was asked in an interview, Basically, she was asked, if you are able to make it successfully as an artist, why is there still a need to be concerned about the collective struggle of Black people? Her response was, to, she said, quote, to destroy the abstraction for the sake of the specific is, in this case, in error. To destroy the abstraction for the sake of the specific is, in this case, an error. And that's where I think you and I read this very differently. Yes. So what I'm saying, when, when you're when you're highlighting the individual stick to itiveness of individuals to overcome obstacles and succeed, I am seeing uh, um, them being rewarded for participating in a system that's going to make sure that only they can succeed. So so that they will be held up. And as Lorraine Hansberry is saying, don't look at me. Mm -hmm. Because and, and hold me up as an example of, of the condition of my people, because when you do that, you destroy the abstraction and you create an error. You destroy the condition. You, you, in other words, you ignore the conditions of my people. OK, right. By focusing you, on the celebrity, the right. celebrity culture we live in, definitely. So when you're saying so, but my point is, when you're saying, look at these individual Jews or look at Kanye or yourself or any one of us who has been able to individually overcome something. Yes. The, the, what we have to be reminded of is that that in many cases, those who are most rewarded for that are doing so because they are participating in the treachery that makes sure that no one can come behind them or with them. So my point is, that's why we have to go back to that distinction we were drawing earlier between Bill Cosby and George Jackson. Mm -hmm. Bill Cosby's stick to uh, allowing him to accumulate wealth relative to the rest of the world, uh, um, was in part or largely the result of his willingness to work against George Jackson and, and his individual stick to to build a collective revolution that would benefit all of us. So that's 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 why I, you know and, and so when we're that's why when what Gabler is doing for me when you make the point about reading our lives, reading our lives, what what I'm my life is being read in G Gabler is that he is saying he is showing me these are the individual handful of Jews that would be become falsely to Lorraine Hansberry's point uh -huh. the standard that wipes out the abstraction that is that wipes out the reality of not only the rest of Jews, but the rest of the world and the rest of the aspirations of the rest of us. So I'm looking at that, like, cause all of us have, in, we all have drive. Poverty is not the result of a lack of drive. Definitely That's, not. So the, so, the example, so, you know, the yeah, example that, that was presented, I want to begin with Bill Cosby, then Lorraine Hansberry, to your point, mm -hmm. The example that Cosby gave to millions of people about what is possible, um, because in another interview, Hansberry's interviewed by Studs Terkel, and she says to him, um, and this is also something she said in a review, a scathing review of Richard Wright's novel, The Outsider, she wrote for Freedom. But she says in that interview, you know, Walter Lee, that she wrote, <sighs> The job of the artist is to show what could be, right? And so even in her work, she shows what could be. Walter Lee, at the end of Hansberry's story, chooses to move out of the conscribed uh, small space that um, the wealthy class would like for him to remain in. 
he does not stay in. And in a similar way for me, the example, despite um, playing a U.S. intelligence officer and I spy, Bill Cosby provided an important example to me about an emotionally present father, an emotionally present husband through the sitcom genre. Not only through that, but through a different world. What is it like to live in college? How, how should you forge your identity without losing your soul? All these things he provided an example about what, yes, I, and I disagree with his choice, but I understand if he were to explain to me, you know, why he had to do I Spy in order to do Bill Cosby, I'd say, okay, it's justified. Because, yeah. because it oh. showed countless generations what it looks like and what it feels like to be a father, not just talk about one, you know, to be it through, like Dick Gregory, comedy, through the vehicle of, um, particularly on television, the sitcom. And a lot of these, and I know there's a connection between what we're reading in the fourth chapter and the work of Cosby, particularly through Warner. Um, I believe it was Tom Warner was his producer, Carsey Werner, Werner rather. Um, Tom, yeah. But my point is, yeah, the, 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 Lorraine Hansberry was clear. She, at the end of her story, she's not going to leave with, with despair. She's going to leave it with possibility um, of what can be. And sometimes that is, that is what the films that these makers are doing for the middle class. You know, they're showing you it's easy to be part of it. It's manageable. It's not hard when you have the support around you. Um, but we have to see that as, as readers that it's a myth. Because of the reality that you said, Jared, the poverty we're going through, the bigger military industrial complex, the increased incarceration of black people, um, we're dealing with that. And, and this is a system that is profiting off of creating more prisoners as we speak. So how, how can we balance this? How can we sh expose that contradiction between Wall Street and Hollywood, what Hollywood, the idea Hollywood is promoting, but the reality that Wall Street is creating, you know, in our individual lives. Um, I mean, I think the artist's role is essential, especially the independent artist. What helped Lorraine Hansberry is her very supportive husband, um, Bob Nemiroff, um, who came from a Jewish family. They met in a camp in New York and his family and his connection helped her produce her play. And it's become like the black dramatic staple, you know, that, 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 um, that uh, what's his name who just passed, who blessed us, the um, amazing artist, Douglas Turner Ward. You know, Douglas Turner Ward called her play like the foundation for the black arts movement that inspired him and so many other writers to write our experience, Lorraine Hansberry's work. But it, it was it was it was meaningful because he Walter Lee was a possibility. I can still assimilate and not lose my soul, and not you know because she writes a dramatic part when Walter's on his knees just before he decides to move in on behalf of his family, behaving like a coon, behaving like the stereotype. Um, he doesn't do it gratefully in front of Lindner, but by the time Lindner comes in to play the second time. He's like, we've decided to occupy because my father, Walter Lee said it, earned it brick by brick. And even though I'm not getting it the way I wanted to by myself, my father earned it. So it's just also, this is part of our heritage. It's not that you mentioned earlier, getting it requires that somebody else not get it. I don't see it like that. I don't see just because I occupy a position that means somebody else has, been, has to be X'd out. Um, I see it as, okay, now you're going to, now here's a responsibility. How responsible are you going to be with it? And I believe that life puts all of us, every individual through steps. And when you've mastered your responsibility in one step, you get to the next, you know, and Cosby proved that, look, I'm going to be doing my own stuff. I'm doing I spy because I'm going to do my own stuff. I spy is not mine. As Camille Cosby made clear, he didn't write I spy. Like every actor, he wants to work. And he worked until he was able to, as 
Denzel Washington said in The Great Debaters, do what you want to do. Um, he performed the role of Wiley, that professor from Wiley College. Um, do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do, what you want to do. And we have to make sure that in the time that we're doing what we have to do, we don't lose our soul. Any more? That's, um, that's the price you have to pay to get to that point. So that's why I just, I, yeah, I, I'm, uh, you know, uh, yeah. It, it, it's not, you know, the, the zero sum game of capitalism is not an issue of belief. It's, it's, it's objective fact. For there to be rich, there has to be poor. So this, if you are going to accumulate wealth, mm -hmm. you're going to create poverty for someone else. That's, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't, it's not, it's not an opinion. That's just what it is. Yes, I so, the system, yes, that's part of the system. I'm, tell, I'm giving you my biblical understanding. And you can debate, you know, I don't mind if you debate with me on the, about the Bible. No, 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 um, I'm not, I, I'm not, not today. <laughs> not about the Bible. So when you say it creates poverty, when somebody occupies a position and it creates poverty. When they accumulate wealth. Yes. Poverty. Yes. And so, um, yeah. I already said that. Okay, yeah. So I, I see what you mean, and I just so that's what I'm saying. I already with, said you know, for, for, for Bill Cosby see. to get to the place where he does, he can do what he ever he wants. Yes. Most, yes. almost all of the rest of us have to be in a position where none of us can do anytime, whatever, anything that we want. That's that's the problem. That that's that's the contradiction. So okay. that's why that's why George Jackson was calling him out by yes. for saying, this isn't about. Bill Cosby's individual aspirations as an actor or an entertainer. This is about the collective of humanity of black people initially and humanity. So, so this whole thing of, of let's stay focused on our individual uh, uh, struggles and path uh, 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 is, is part of the encouraged problem. Oh, okay. So, so that's why, you know, what, what George, you know, what, the, what we should be advocating is not that Bill Cosby has to, speak against the black liberation struggle so that he can later come back and, and pro provide a very middle class fantasy. Uh, that shouldn't be the goal. The goal should be not participating against the liberation struggle that would make the, the need that some would have later for a Cosby show moot. Uh, uh, and, you know, so, you know, part of, you know, he, he, he helped create, was encouraged to help create a fantasy that I feel like I'm struggling against to this day, why, which is why I literally have a, a project titled It's Not a Different World about the reality of the HBCU experience, because mm. many people, particularly of a certain That's generation. a professor who taught there, yes. Who teaches, who teaches there teaches. now. Who was who? Who was currently literally engaged in in a, in a, in a, in a uh, I guess a benign, neglectful struggle with them at this point now? Mm -hmm. Is 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 he helped create a fantasy that may have promoted people going to these HBCUs, but is not the experience people are having. Certainly not faculty. So so yeah, yeah. as somebody anyway, so, who so, left the HBCU, I I, I agree with yeah. that. So anyway, that's that that would be it. you know. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I think, yeah, that, that's, yeah. So finishing the third chapter, this is yeah. a great discussion between the old and the new. He finishes about um, yeah. Lindley. No, no, no. It's called Born on the Fourth of July. And now we're going to right. the fourth chapter between the old life and the new. And I had so much notes on this chapter. Um, I'm going to just share with you a few of them and just get your thoughts. Let me see. Uh, oh, yes. Okay. Fox. He's talking about Fox. Um, oh, we, Roxy. He spends so much time on Roxy. No, Roxy is a, that's one thing we didn't get. Maybe we can come back to that next week. Um, his discussion okay. on Ro Roxy and, you know, Roxy's okay. whole experience. Um, Sam, he talks about the Warner Brothers. So it made me think of that typical theme song from the Warner Brothers. Dun, 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 dun. The big WB. And um, I remember <laughs> also growing up. Um, Tiny Toon Adventures and mm. uh, those cartoons, after school cartoons produced by Warner Brothers. And I, it made me think about also what were the values in those? Um, you know, um, but it was very interesting learning about Jack, who seemed to be the real diehard business type, and Sam, 
who seemed to be the more family, diplomatic Warner, um, Harry rather, not Sam, Harry. Um, Gabler writes on page 121, Harry was antithetical to Jack in almost every way. Sober where Jack was silly, conservative where Jack was loud, self-conscious where Jack was thoughtless. Um, and I was getting the, what I found the main ideas. Sam offered to, which Sam is this? Sam. Okay. Yeah, I, the, the name, I, honestly, it's, it's a lot, I, I've lost. It's that. a lot of new names. It's, it's, okay. Sam and Jack. Uh, right. uh, so they get the investment. And yeah. what I found interesting was, he, um, Gabler writes on 127, to Jack, Benjamin Warner was living proof that the values of Europe and Judaism couldn't really function in the new world. This is deep. In, in time, the father would be just as scornful of his son. Um, but during the trip to Pittsburgh, these two antagonists shared an intimacy that would never be repeated. And, you know, they order ham and eggs. And so that's supposed to be intimate. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I, I was, um, yeah, I was interested in, you know, Gabler's sentimentality and showing these Warners is very sympathetic. Um, then he writes, Gabler on 128 writes, um, the Warner's very first production was a Western called Peril of the Plains, co-written and co-produced by Sam and Jack and directed by Sam. Um, their inexperience showed. Peril of the Plains and another film they shot at the same time failed. Um, and then he talks about what the goal of the film was. This is on the same page, 128. Um, Harry would later claim that he was chiefly motivated to do film by a need to educate. Um, and for Harry, this was also probably true. The first films he produced reliably promoted old fashioned virtues. A third motive was more interesting. Um, the vicarious charge he got, um, one longtime Warner's employee speculated the most powerful attraction for Harry was the vicarious charge he got from the chaos of movie making. So um, Harry liked the chaos of it. He promoted values and he wanted to educate. Um, the Warners produced a film on venereal disease and it made me think of um, when the interviewer asked Ruby D in the American Archive of Television, what was one of the first thing, and this was in the 40s, so this time is in the late teens, the teens. But it's interesting how the work Ruby D could get in the 40s when she was working for American Negro Theater <laughs> was a film where she said she, she was the nice girl who had the venereal disease, you know from the First World War to the Second World War. It's like, what are the, you know, what are the opportunities, you know? And she was brutally honest about the lack of real, like, real human <laughs> opportunities for actors of color in the 40s. Oh, it's, no, I'm it's sure. It to be yeah. these hand-me-downs from the teens. These hand-me-downs. So, just, just one thing, uh, Again, this chapter does is more kind of the same thing for me that 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 I've already mentioned. Um, but it 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 reminds me honestly. You know, uh, I, I once upon I, my mother grew up in 1930s Brooklyn and would talk about how people don't understand. You know, looking at Brooklyn today, you know, there were Brooklyn at that time was. <clears throat> The, considered the middle of nowhere. It didn't have paved roads, didn't have plumbing, didn't have, you know, it was like the dirt roads, horse-drawn carriages. And and I remember asking her if, um, I wa have you ever seen the movie uh, Once Upon a Time in America? Uh, it's, it's, it's starring Robert De Niro and James Woods. It's a, it's a, it's a great film uh, about uh, gangsters in New York, Jewish gangsters in New York. And they depict that that sort of early New York life. And I remember asking my mother about that. And she said, you know, it was very accurate. And what you get is kind of like what you hear here. It's, it's, it's overcrowded, really poor, gross, disgusting. Everybody's nasty. And there is this attempt. And my mother even would tell me about, like, she remembers this as a kid, what, what is being discussed here, that there was an attempt 
of of uh, European immigrants to overtly try to bring the new Europeans out of a state of savagery and become this new improved American. So there would be, you know, she, there would be like pamphlets. They would hand out pamphlets, like you know, telling people to you know take a bath, brush your teeth. <laughs> you know, stop, you know, seriously, it was like, just like you see what he's talking about here. Like, you know, I got to make a movie to tell people, you know, not to get VD. I got to, you know, I got to, you know, you know, tell you to use the toilet and then wash your hands. Like, it's like all this stuff is being, and because from, again, what Gabler is, you know, and sort of, you know, what their, what their goal is, is we're trying to get away from that past and become something new. And we're going to, as he said, we're going to invent this new country. So even with the Westerns, even today, there's new information. People are still researching and coming out with all this. The, the, what we think of the wild, wild West is a fantasy that yes. was in part created by Jews in Hollywood and wasps who wanted to project, pr present this national historical fantasy of these proud white men moving west and bringing civilization over the savages of the Indians and all this other kind of stuff. And these were tough, you know, da, da, da. When, when, you know, most of them were like, you know, not carrying guns. They were, you know, you know, cattle herders. And it was like some very boring, un, you know, whatever life. But, but the fantasy of this, no, because they weren't just cowboys. They were this new America is expanding westward and all this other kind of stuff. So, so anyway, that it, it's just it's just really fascinating to see, even from Gabler's, you know, it's in, 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 you know, limited perspective, just what was really going on here. And again, this this fear of we can't fail in the project of creating a mythological America that we yes. have a place in. Mythological. Yeah. Um, so anyway. The well, name of that I film is Once Upon a Time in America. Yeah, Once Upon a Time in America. It's a, it's a, and I, and I'll be honest with you, it came out in the '80s. I've watched it several times. It's it's a really good movie, and I just thirty years later learned something about the plot that I had never known that is messing with me. So it's 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 it leaves a lot to think about. Now, just a, just a trigger warning. It's it's. Uh, you know, wildly violent, wildly violent against women. It is, it is not, it, it was made, I won't go too much into it, but it was made intentionally to speak against the 1970s and, and previous films about the gangster that was promoting them as like a, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a, like a, like something to be proud of. It was done intentionally to make gangsters look bad and they oh. do. So like, there's no, you know, there's no Don Corleone in this joint. Like, it's all just horrible thugs. But, uh, um, but that leads me to one other point that I would, I, I just want to throw out there for you sure. and our and, and our audience here. That that one thing that I think would be great to to add to this conversation would be a discussion, a deep dive at some point of the films that these that are being made. That, that Gabler is talking about. Like in this chapter alone, he talks about a lot of films that are made. I haven't seen most of them. And, and I bet that there's a lot of gems in an analysis of those yeah. films that, that would explain what's happening here. I agree. Uh, so anyway, yeah, because sometimes we're so busy reading. I know I am. I don't have time to read and watch films that they're mentioning, including The Jazz Singer, which Gabler spends a lot of time on. A lot of time on, yeah. Course chapter, which I appreciate because, um, like you said, it, it, it highlights uh, one disagreement we had, which is whether you can uh, reconcile the business to the beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to read what Gabriel, I think it's, even though I think this is his best writing so far in this mm. chapter, on page 145, Jack's quandary, he's talking about the main character in the Jazz Singer, uh, a film that um, Warner promoted. Um, so he says, Jack's quandary is that he can bring Judaism to show business, but he cannot bring show business to Judaism, which is to say that Judaism cannot be reinvigorated or revitalized in America or by America. It is alien to it. 
And Gabler almost is writing as a Jew himself, too. Mm -hmm. so say that. As Jack's mother says, he has it. Jewish prayers, all in his head, but not it is not in his heart. Adding by way of explanation, he is of America. And this is to your point. This new America is different from where we've come from. Um, you can't really be a Jew the way you were in Germany now in America. Right. In the end, Jackie Jack Gabler writes can affect no resolution. His father won't let him be an American. America won't let him be a Jew. Caught between the old life and the new, he is like the Hollywood Jews of both and of neither. In the play, Jack yields to Jackie and replaces his father on Yom Kippur. Um, yeah, of course, this surrender would never do for Jack Warner, period. And so Warner wouldn't have that message in his film that he would, you know, go back to his father's values and become a rabbi, um, you know. And so that's like- It's okay. deep, right? I mean, it's wild, right? I yeah. Mean, it's like so much of, of, again, the personal and collective trauma of these people is playing out in the popular mainstream public art. And I think that's still going on today. Yes, the, the, that that those in power of all backgrounds, I think they do live in various stages of fear over over what might happen if they ever let their foot up off our back, and and they're constantly trying to address themselves and and their interests to our own, and uh, uh, so anyway, I, I you know, but again, as I'm hearing even you just reread that part, I mean, it's 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 it's. It, 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 all I was thinking was everybody to become quote unquote successful has to attach themselves to this myth and this fantasy and and, 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 and lose themselves in the process. Now, there are different outcomes in terms of power, like black people who do the same thing don't end up with the same power as Jews. Uh, uh, um, in most cases at least and so on and so forth but everybody that enters this process ends up losing themselves and cannot become and that's again where we probably do disagree like you can't keep yourself uh, and go up in this business uh, because it, it only values what, what serves it and, and so it will take a black aversion and or make an arrangement on that it'll, and, it'll and, and put you know allow within a certain lane that to, to you know person or group to thrive jews are in another lane but a similar version in terms of you still gotta you know conform to a certain uh uh ethic uh politics and anyway so religious exactly. freedom um i'm so fascinated by a lot of Jews' promotion of religious freedom and i think that's an important part of the myth that there needs to be a religious freedom um as somebody who is a Christian myself, when I see a, a different religion um, operating in the mainstream, but hidden in plain sight, then it's like, it's almost overtly um, Jewish. But I'm told I cannot acknowledge my faith, you know, publicly. Where When I see those in power clearly um, wielding their power to De to to portray demonstrate their faith um i'm just as you your, your point there just reminds me of this one of the bulwarks uh, of our society is its pride in a separation between church and state you know um but in practice we see you know previous presidents all with yarmulkes visiting the wall all where that's not a separation of church and state you know that's clearly um, taking a position not with the church but with the tradition um, of U.S. presidents since around this time that this book is set in, you know, since the teens. President so I mean, uh, yeah. Again, we don't have time to get into all. Yeah, this, but I, <laughs> I do want to read, read a few more. Com I didn't want to read two comments. Let me just say, but, but but I just want to say though, very quick. I'll keep it very brief. That that, mm -hmm. that I would read that differently when when presidents and politicians you know, pay this fealty to, to, to Jews and Israel. That's not about religion. And it's not about ethnicity. It's about Zionism. It's about imperialism. That's a political, that's, that's politics. Judy is, and, and, and what Gabler, I think, is, is, is saying is that, is, is, in showing here is that Jews 
Jews in this country do not want to, uh, for the most part, advocate and promote themselves and promote uh, 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 themselves as Jews, not because of some attempt to be sneaky and underhanded, but because of this fear that when white people focus on us, we get wiped out. So, and, and the goal, as Gabler is laying out, is that Jews are saying, we don't want to be known as Jews. We want to be Americans. Americans. That's why the whole born on the 4th of July, changing the name, marrying Gentile wives, you know, all of that stuff uh, uh, that Gabler is outlining here, the production of films that support the white supremacist project, all of that is done. They're not promoting, they're not creating films about Judaism and Jews. They're not, they're not even defending Jews who are being slaughtered in, 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 in Nazi At Europe. At this time, definitely. At this time, they're, 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 they're whole, and, and I would argue in a different way maybe, but then similarly to this day, there's no overt interest among Jews to aggressively announce themselves as Jews. I would argue, lastly, this is what I keep going back to with Marimba Ani's work that I think is so fascinating about how she argued this, that, that, that Christianity had to be developed by Europeans out of Judaism because it is an imperial and an aggressive and overt uh, 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 right response the, to that. Whereas public. Judaism is very nationalistic, matriarchal. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't overtly go for recruiting others into it it's it, it, it's quite the opposite so okay. it, it's all anyway there's i think there's anyway there's a lot of these things going on but that's just anyway go ahead Sorry thank you ahead. i just want to finish up now um i appreciate the time we spent on the um whole book up to the four, fourth chapter i wanted to read two comments in particular i see one from finding her light who agrees with your earlier point, she says, finding her light says, the black business class has exploited us as black people more than anyone else. And then be more underscore. Sorry. I don't know about more than anyone else, but. Okay. <laughs> that, that was in the time we were talking about Bill Cosby. And yeah, 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 yeah. George Jackson. I mean, they've gotten it in, but I don't know about more. Uh, right. maybe, you know, you know, anyway, yeah. And I think that's. Yeah, I don't know about more either. Uh, <laughs> more underscore Solar Punk says, what you have to do doesn't have to be business or self-advancement. Could be collective organizing. Or, I agree with that. So those organizing, um, um, in terms of today, we welcome, hi, Dirac. Hey, Nashville. Red. Hey, Christopher Kager. Thank you for joining us on our... What's up, uh, Christopher Kager? Um... Yeah, it could be organizing. And I think or good organizers don't announce themselves as a general rule because <laughs> they're going to threaten their own effective organizing. Um, okay. You learn about them years down the line. And I, I can't really, through the way he's writing it, like you said, he jumps from person to person with names and anecdotes. And it's I couldn't even identify an organizer in this part. The closest one I could think of might be the Warners um and but that, they're not doing the kind of organizi organizing we're talking i mean they, their organization yeah. was for for the dominance of a market where you know i think the, the at least as i interpret the comment it's about what we're being what is we're always being told that our, our response to our condition should be or at least led by a business effort or an individual effort and 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 what i interpret that comment to say and I agree with is that our real strength and potential power is in organizing, not in money, not in business, not in individual anything. So if we do that and put our energies there, I think we Absolutely. get better. I see Ricky Ryan has just joined us. Welcome, Ricky He's Ryan. Ready. I appreciate your article in the Black Agenda Report about hashtag imperialism. That was a powerful article. And I think it speaks mm. to what Jared just said about organizing. Um, being more important mm. than philanthropy, waiting on philanthropy or business, um, just focusing on one's business. It is more, more important than that is, is absolutely organizing. So next week we plan to read chapters five and six. I don't get ulcers. I give them is the name of chapter five. And then that, 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 that is the end of part one. Chapter six begins the second part, part two, the empire. And the sixth chapter's title is In Their Image. So we look forward to talking about those chapters next week.
have a great in the meantime i'm really trying to see if i could see the jazz singer you know you know what? I, I tell you what. If if, if you want to pick one, at least one, I, I'll do that. I was also thinking, um, um, what was that other one that I was thinking I might want to? Uh, I th I thought I might even go see the or try to see the Great Train Robbery. Although I think I oh, yeah. that not too long ago. Um, but I'm, I'm I would I don't think I've ever seen the jazz singer, at least not all the way through. So so I might I'm gonna try to check that out too. Uh, okay. Um, but he mentions a lot. I mean, there's a whole bunch of movies in here that that I bet, you know, like I've never even seen some of these bigger ones like Citizen Kane. That he talked, he mentions, um, uh, I don't think I've ever seen that. An American Tragedy. I've never seen that. The Christian Century. Uh, I've never seen that. You know, so there's a bunch of stuff that the Independent uh so this is uh, anyway so so like i and i bet that they have a lot to say about what gabler is describing these people are going through or you know you know anyway Definitely. so so if um our listeners can join us in watching some of the films that gabler mentions please do that and join us next week saturday at 9 a.m all right thanks have a lot everybody week. peace now take, care. take it easy